Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Evgeny Belina. I'm one of the members of the curatorial team of the project I'm thinking and learning new Sonic series and practice practices. Uh, greetings to all those who joined us today and are watching our stream. Today we are launching our open lectorium, which will become a platform for discussing the place of sound and in contemporary art and everyday life. Uh, this project is the result of collaboration between a uh, master program uh, sound studies in sonic arts at the Universitat der Kunst Berlin and another master program uh, sound art and sound studies at HSE Art and Design School in Moscow. I would like to thank everyone who has involved in this process. Uh, of course, this project would not have taken place uh, without the help of another institution, the Goethe Institute. Our online laboratory takes place with, within year of Germany in Russia, 2020, 2021. Uh, the director of Goethe Institute in Moscow, uh, Frau uh, Dr. Heike Ulik, has recorded a welcome video for us, which I propose to watch now. Now I will share my screen and run this video. Sehr geehrte Teilnehmerinnen und Teilnehmer, liebe Organisatoren des Projektes Unthinking and Learning the New Sonic Theories and Praxis. Ich freue mich sehr, Sie im Rahmen dieses Projektes im Deutschlandjahr in Russland 2020-21 begrüßen zu dürfen. Und ich tue dies auch im Namen der Deutschen Botschaft in Moskau, der Deutsch-Russischen Auslandshandelskammer und natürlich im Namen des Goethe-Institutes, die wir gemeinsam die Veranstaltungen im Deutschland ja koordinieren und organisieren. Die Zeiten könnten kaum komplexer sein und deshalb setzt das Deutschland ja auf den Dialog und die Zusammenarbeit in möglichst vielen Bereichen des gesellschaftlichen Lebens. In Bildung und Sprache, Kunst und Kultur, Wissenschaft, Wirtschaft, Technologien, Umweltschutz, Klimaschutz und Nachhaltigkeit. Das Projekt Unthinking and Learning präsentiert sich im Bereich der Bildung und der Musik. Und es richtet sich nicht nur an Studierende, sondern an alle Interessierte an Musikwissenschaft, Klangkunst und Kulturwissenschaft. Dadurch, dass das Projekt online übertragen wird, können wir natürlich auch sehr viele Teilnehmerinnen und Teilnehmer in ganz Russland erreichen. Das Projekt wird vom Label Klammklang in Zusammenarbeit mit der Hochschule der Künste in Berlin, der Designschule der Higher School of Economics in Moskau und von namhaften Künstlern im Bereich Sound Studies realisiert. Das ist auch ein Kennzeichen aller Projekte und Veranstaltungen im Deutschlandjahr. Es geht immer um eine deutsch-russische Zusammenarbeit, um einen deutsch-russischen Kontakt. Wir dürfen dem Team und dem Projekt gratulieren, dass es unter 700 Einreichungen bei den Antragsprojekten einen Zuschuss erhalten hat. Herzlichen Glückwunsch und viel Erfolg wünschen wir den Teilnehmerinnen und Teilnehmern und schauen Sie auch bei anderen Veranstaltungen des, an Veranstaltungen des Deutschlandjahres vorbei. Auf der Webseite gotgermani.erf können Sie sehen, was Sie vielleicht interessieren könnte. Vielen Dank und alles Gute. So, uh, it was really, really kind from uh, Frau Heike Ulrich. And uh, now I will now briefly describe our lecture program in general. Uh, it is divided into three thematic blocks. Uh, the first will be devoted to the consideration of sound as an agent of social and political relations. The second, uh, called unthinking, will focus on a more speculative philosophical understanding of sound. It will examine how sound can change our traditional ideas about ontology and subjectivity. The third block will be dedicated to the search for new artistic practice that is possible when working with sound. Of course, such a division is not strict, but rather formal. The topics that will be raised in each of these blocks will intersect with all the others, complement and modulate each other. The fact is that we, 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 when we talk about sound studies and sound art, uh, the traditional opposition uh, of theory and practice stops working. They are not two autonomous spheres of human activity, as it was understood in the classical humanities. 
but rather an organic and reciprocal continuation of each other. You can, can, you can find, uh, find out uh, the schedule of lectures on our website. All of them start uh, at uh, 19 o'clock by Moscow time. Uh, the lectures will last about an hour, after which we will have time for discussion. Ask your question here in the Zoom chat or on YouTube also in chat. We'll definitely pass them uh, on to the lecturer. Uh, today begins our first block on the political agency of sound. Uh, I'm incredibly happy and glad, uh, both as a curator and as faithful reader, uh, that Salome Vögelin opens our lecture course. Salome Vögelin is an artist, writer, and researcher engaged in listening as a socio-political practice. She is a professor of sound at the London College of Communication. She also currently represents the professorship uh, clan Kunst in the Kunstwissenschaften at the Braunschweig University of Fine Art in Germany. Uh, Salome is also uh, the author of one of the most important books, well, as I believe, for contemporary sound studies. Uh, this is Listening to Noise and Silence and Sony Possible Worlds. Her lecture today, as far as I understand, will be based on her last book, The Political Possibility of Sound. So it seems to me that I have already uh, delayed my introduction and uh, I again want to encourage you to ask questions uh, in Zoom chat or in YouTube chat. And now I give the floor to you, Salome. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Evgeny, for this introduction. Thank you very much. I am just quickly going to share if I can my um, slide show, sorry. Mm -hmm. Everything is great. So, voila. Well, thank you. Thank you very much to Evgeny and for the organizers to invite me to give this talk and to give this sort of starting talk is a great, great privilege. And I hope I can sort of, um, set some ideas in the room that then can hopefully be discussed further. Um, I have, as Evgeny said, sort of started this talk um, around or from this book, The Political Possibility of Sound. Or, but as you will see, what I'm what I'm trying to do with this talk is sort of to this book was published in 2018. So before the pandemic, and I will try to sort of rethink some of its consequences and some of its issues and whether they still stand and how they maybe stand differently after this time, uh, which I think is a, I will, I will position as a very important time as a maybe underplayed time in terms of the political and in terms of the possibilities that have closed and the possibilities that we may through our ears may be open. I have made a slideshow, but I'm very aware that a lot of you might be in here just with headphones and enjoying this a little bit more as a, as a radio broadcast, which I fully understand and how I consume at the moment also a lot of talks and, and, and events that happen online. So I suppose the slides and the rhythm of the slides is kind of as much for you something to look at as much as it is for me a rhythm to, um, to, to, to be with and to for me to give my voice a rhythm and to kind of be able to have some sort of um, song, if you will, in my talk. So Sonic Post, The Political Possibility of Sound is a book that I published in 2018, Miss Bloomsbury, and it is an event that now seems so long ago, and not only long ago, but in a completely different universe or in a completely different world where very different things seem to play and seem to become real or normal, that normal that we crave so very much, and this normal that I will come back to. So it is not only in the past, but it is also in a different space, and it makes me think very much how these differences of space and place and time function together and how they enter into a simultaneity. And there are also new impossibilities and, um, and, and that are being um, produced through the politics and how the pandemic is governed and how the pandemic is controlled or what is governed and controlled through it. Through it. Um, so they present also darker and disturbing realities. Um, we care, um, their care, the care for the other or the care for 
the vaccines for one country rather than another country, et cetera, et cetera, is a, is a decoy actually for a political violence suppression and the confident reassertion of a patriarchal su supremacist power structures. That is a norm, that is the norm that we apparently crave to go back to, um, but that has underneath it many hidden occurrences and anxieties and things that maybe we should rethink whether we really want to go back to those. So there are transformations I feel I have observed with my ears, with my eyes. In this time, oops, I'm trying to move the slideshow onwards and that doesn't seem to work. Oh, well, maybe that way. So can we hear this transformation? Can we sound with them or against them? Can sound be one of those modes, a critical listening as a critical social practice of nuance, as a leaning in when the social distance obviously doesn't permit us to come too close? Um, can it prepare us, can it get us into tune with this notion of normalcy and what actually has happened in the pandemic and to prepare us also, if not for this one now, which hopefully will come to an end, but then for the next one, which surely will come. Um, so that we are equipped to sound the possibilities and impossibilities of care and collectivity in a way that does not snap back and does not just support this interest of a of a, of a supremacist, of a patriarchal power, but that actually has the potential to use this anormality that we are experiencing and that I'm certainly experiencing something like this for the first time in my life to a different end, to really be in care and collectivity in a connecting and connected world, rather than go for, for more individuated imaginings of power. Um, The small breath drawn before speaking sounds the molding of air for words. And I like that small breath, that, that small, small sound that we all make all the time before we say anything and onto that air we then send whatever we are saying, send to project it out into the world to, to hit you with my breath, with my body. It is a form of intimacy and it, it involves our mouths to talk, to talk with each other. It is, a, it is a physical engagement that obviously now on Zoom, we can't really do. You will not feel my breath when I speak, but you can at least imagine it. Or you can speak now as you are in your individual spaces yourself, make some sounds and hear that small air and what voices you could potentially mold. What space of air does it take to reform, to regenerate our mouths, to make different sounds, to rethink the norms with which we speak. The pandemic is an extreme event and it will become clear where I go back to it, not as a sort of an obsession and, and as a, the only thing to talk about, but as something that we need to talk about in order to understand where we actually are. So it is an extreme event and extreme events are catalysts for a different thinking and a different talking. Sometimes the impossibility to speak at all. Sometimes we have no utterances for an extreme event and what goes on. Sometimes it defies language and we have to search for another one or a defiant muteness after wars, after a crisis, after an extreme, or new utterances, new gesture words, new ways to express ourselves and a new breath to be found. The rise of a different music has obviously been pre-played or the different sound work has pre-played in the 40s and 50s after the Second World War, after the very quick succession of the First and the Second World War, embodied, really brought home to us the notion of such an extreme. So as different voices had to be found in sound and in music to deal with the harmonies and tone um, um, hierarchies of the classical modernist period that stand as political and ideological harmonies and hierarchies of that very period. And they couldn't hold anymore at that moment. And that all that was connected with it, that had brought us up to, or had brought people up to this moment of the war and the post-war, had to go, even if it meant tending towards madness and inarticulation, even if it meant tending towards destroying music as we knew it and playing a different one. There was a rupture, a break, attending into alien voices, to let the small breath linger in silence, to find a different voice and a different way to articulation. So it, it, it enabled or it needed, it necessitated the break with tonal structures through serialism and eventually aleatoric systems. The break was instrumental, was the instrumental source of music through musique concrète. The break with the voice as Antonin Artaud performed it. The break with philosophy 
and the different body had to be found for philosophy, as I believe Maurice Merleau-Ponty did, and so on, so many breaks in culture. Now, I do not mean to belittle those wars, or I do not mean in any way say that this pandemic is anything we can compare it with, at least not for me, for us in the global north, where it hasn't had um, in any way, maybe the consequences that we see in the global south, so we'll come to see in the global south. So I do not mean to hypercast COVID into an extreme en par with the wars, but where the similarities sit and where we can use it to rethink is with an extreme. I lived quite a charmed life really through it all. You know, I miss, of course, being with people. I still miss being with people. I miss the contact. I miss many things. But I have been, I have, I have been in quite a, a, a cared for position in terms of my job, in terms of where I live, in terms of many things. It doesn't mean, however, that there is not that it is not an extreme, an extreme that is real and that we should not rush over in our desire for normality, because as an extreme, it also offers us something else, a, a different normality. So instead of sort of arguing over whether it is as bad as a war or not, or whether it is um, something that's really so terrible, I think what we could be looking at with our ears, if possible, is the normality, the normality that it has revealed, the normality we now all long to go back to, so that we hear it with, dif with difference and with nuances in its absence, that its absence brings us to its possibilities and to its impossibilities anew, and to think again what what it could mean, what this normality was, what it did, and what it actually, um, what it, we now could make real as impossibilities, as that which seemed not possible to do before. But it is not necessarily through the past, so it's not a going back to a, a causal way or through a, an explanation of a war to explain the pandemic or say the Spanish flu, etc. It's not for me about the chronological causal way as a closed event of history that we can make sense of the impossibilities and think it possible again, thinking and sounding ourselves back to normal. That certainly is not what I mean at all. Instead, it is listening through a past that is simultaneous with the present, that we can come to appreciate how we can render the post-pandemic as a post-extreme, a post-normal, rather than a new normal or another normal. Because making the connections to a past is not necessarily to stop us, to snap us back into a normality that we long for, but to open a space where we can understand the past and the present, the here and the there, and the here and the there, and now in this simultaneity, this complex simultaneity that our ears can get us to, that we can come to understand audibly, not so very visually, but audibly, as we can imagine, an, a multi-sensory dimensionality of all these times together to understand the normal and the anormal and the post-normal and the post-pandemic and where we want to be. In some ways, the virus is more perfidious and candid as the war. It is not as clear cut. We don't really know who's against who here because we are the virus. The virus isn't there without us. And the virus is in the in-between. It is in our connections between us on that small breath is also the virus. It has a sonic sensibility. And therefore, it also sonic thinking that can get us to understand it, to understand its mobile and relational um, reality, and think from these invisible connections into how, how we might respond, what are the things that we might have to change in our lives, what connections, interconnections, our lives, our habits, we might have to pay or would want to pay a different attention to. Periods of extremes are shaped by breaks and ruptures, promises and hopes for a post, whatever it was that came before. But in order to get to a post that bears no resemblance to what got us here and opens a different feel for the imagination, that's the post normal I'm hoping for. One where we take this opportunity not to go back, but to have a post that comes from the simultaneity of all the times together, that comes from a sonic sensibility and a sonic understanding of how we live in this world. So a post, a post normal that does not go back, that doesn't find back to a cozy, comfortable normality that we knew and the political possibilities that I knew and talked about in 2018, but a post normal that we can generate now on that small breath before that 
that escapes us and that, that breathes the word into being as we speak. So a post that opens a space in itself. Sorry. But the post itself, the notion of post itself doesn't open that space. The post very much has to be done. It has to be practiced. We have to open that space ourselves um, in order not to snap back to the normal and to the divisions and to the dialectical of the before. Because the wars I started with, or that kind of past, that history that we have at our disposal to understand where we are, is a very, to, for me as well, at, at least from where I'm talking, it's a very European view. It's a very European view on what the breaks and the ruptures were. And I know obviously that will change or that is different for everybody um, across the globe. But it is also a very white male narrative of those wars where they were white male wars based on a sense of a masculinity that coincided with imperialism and colonialism, conceptual and actual, with the notion of greed and capture, and with a hunger for the other's land and the domination of the other's body. It coincided with a visual, with an ocular philosophy and worldview, with maps and a geography that had borders and lines, and land was seen to be able to be captured, to be invaded, to be had. The military as a sense of the world, as a sense of the power and the agitation of the world in order to capture the other. So this war that I've conjured in order for us to sort of think back into an extreme and think back into past ruptures and past breaks in music and in sound art, brings with it that very visual view and an ocular worldview and an ocular politics that anything we do stands in a dialectical relationship with. And in many ways, the, the pandemic is a continuation of exactly the causes of that ocular worldview. It just has morphed into another form. It is not a literal war as we know it, but it is still has the, is the, has the consequences of the colonial, of invasion, of um, all these attributes. It is an extreme of a global world where our codependence and utter interdependence plays a role. The codependence and interdependence we do not necessarily take care of, but only work with in order to have trade or business or to exploit each other, not in a responsible way, but in a where can we ship things to. So we do not really want to acknowledge maybe this global world, particularly not in the sense of a responsibility, but only when it comes to trade and business. And it is haunting us now in the form of an invisible that as a virus shares all our air and makes a mockery of maps and of the colonial and of the imperial that thinks it can individuate and grab a land or close a border. The, uh, the virus that is in the air that we all breathe, it hits us all the same, but that as previous extremes also emphasizes the asymmetries of the sameness through radical different consequences, local and global. It is a barometer of difference and inequality. The asymmetries between individuals with access to different technologies and access to different living spaces. The asymmetries between individuals who work within the safe public sector as myself. And, and those who are unemployed or those with precarity zero hour employment. Um, the asymmetries between countries, oxygen supplies, hospitals and vaccines and those without. And I could go on. So what, what, is re what is revealed in the air that we share and that we've become aware through the virus, but that sound can also get us to are these asymmetries that we live essentially in an extremely asymmetrical world that maps that a visual, that an ocular worldview do not show us those asymmetries. They pretend a sameness, a flatness of the earth, if you will, almost sort of medieval. I have digressed extremely away from sounds um, in, a, in many ways into a, in a talk about health and politics, but I think there is a point to it. And I will hopefully rejoin the invisible shortly in a sonic sense and in a sound art sense that makes sense and works within, within this series of talks. But I do feel, and I do feel this strongly, I am at this moment not really able to talk and give a talk about 
sound arts or sonic thinking in a way that I would have done before the pandemic. I feel unable to sit down and write or think about anything that, as if it hadn't happened, as if we would still mingle in the same way as before. Because I think those issues that I tried to summarize very briefly, those issues of ruptures and breaks and of a chronology that is not a chronology, but a simultaneity, a simultaneity of history and of space of countries that seem mapped separate and apart that have come together through the virus and through the air and whose codependence has become so very apparent. That is, I feel, the most important issue to really at the moment reflect upon culturally as well as politically, what kind of sound art can we do in this milieu? What kind of music sound art can we do? And what is, was it that sound can bring to this discussion, the sonic sensibility that clearly as we are here enjoying this, this lecture theories and practice, practical workshop are interested in sound. And it is exactly sound to me that can get us not back to the normal that we think we crave, but that can allow us to hear and listen to these nuances of relationships between space and time and patriarchal imperial colonial orders and the virus and to get to a post normal rather than back to the normal as a new normal, but more of the same that was before. So that's why I am, I am I'm, I'm, I'm utterly compelled to to speak about this and cannot help it, but I hope it will pay off. I hope it will make sense because I think it can feed in so many discussions that we had before the pandemic, the um, discussions on the decolonial, on knowledge systems, on plural knowledges, whose knowledge is it that counts, whose voices count, etc. These are still the themes that I think are vital and are now becoming ever more vital, but that are also under threat by this demand or by this longing to go back to a normal, a patriarchal normal, a conventional normal, a canonical normal that does not equip us to deal with the very demands the virus asks of us, which is to accept the plurality of the word, to accept the plurality of knowledges that we need to live in it and the plurality of voices that we need to listen to. So, I cannot just speak about the political possibility of sound, but need to speak about the pandemic as a source of a different political possibility and a different imagination and a different possibility for sound art. To use, thus I use or agitate our common interest in sound, listening and hearing to imagine the post, not in a dialectical way, not in a sort of anti visocentric way, um, but as a post normal that goes a completely different way, that can't snap back into the opposite, that is not following an antonymic logic, but can unperform normality from the invisible of sound to rethink and think about what that even was. So it can help us make sense of it, of the travels of the invisible and its diverse impact and its consequences and its asymmetries and reveals to us the interdependencies that the virus charts unheard and unseen. And it can reveal what it brings and help us think on how to take it as an invitation not to go back to the normal as a new normal, but to appreciate a post normal as an unnormal that makes us think what the normal is and how else we want to live. To go to a new place that is not bound to the old, but lives with the old in a simultaneity that it breaks with. Um, so this is all very personal and not really scholarly. It's very emotive, it's my emotions, it's my being on these sort of framework of Zoom or Big Blue Button or whatever it is over the past 12, 13 months. It is my own body speaking in this very tense and, and slightly terse position. Um, but it isn't just an indulgent rant, I don't think. It is not just um, a kind of notion of gelaber and even peinlich. It isn't just an utter babble and this embarrassing. I rather think it is, it is the only thing we have left, in effect. It is what we have left, is our dealing with it, it is our emotions. And in having distanced us so through the virus, it is exactly this proximity of our bodies and of our experience and of our emotions that will get us to a different understanding of it all. So it's for me not about um, bringing back a notion of vision, Wissenschaft, of objectivity, of a systemic analysis, and, and, and 
interpretation of sound art and music, but it is dealing exactly with this body that's been sitting here and has been listening from this position, isolated and thinking about its own vulnerability and its proximity to other people through the virus and yet the need to distance oneself from other people because of the virus. And if that is embarrassing and if that causes sentiments and, and an effective sense of the body and bringing the body into sound arts discourse where some might expect or demand Wissenschaft, objectivity and, and an analytical voice, then I think for me, the post starts there. The post starts exactly, the post normal starts exactly at that moment where we understand that Wissenschaft might not now get us any more to understand the world once we have sort of appreciated that there is a post normal, that there is another way we now have to live together or understand the entanglement of our living together in a responsible and responsible way with each other. So the notion of embarrassment is really important to me here, the notion of embarrassment and the affective and the emotional and the sentimental and bringing those into this notion of an objective way we could talk about sound art and music and to abandon, for me, abandon this systemic way to talk about the scholarly, the wissenschaftliche discussion of art and philosophy and politics that deals in objective views and systemic analysis. For me, that doesn't work anymore. Those channels of interpretation don't work anymore, as they exactly represent the ocular ideology that got us here in the first place, that represent exactly this notion of supremacy and maps and domination and the one voice to and the one book of reference or the lexicon of reference that we all need to listen to and the neoliberal explo explo exploitation and imperialism that in a way got us to the situation that we're in. So I think the break I'm suggesting is a break exactly with the systemic and the lexicon and the singular notion of knowledge that pretends to be the only one that can know the situation and bring in that body that is embarrassing, that is fluid, that is unstable, unreliable, that hears all sorts of things and makes all sorts of sounds um, into sound arts discourse, into music discourse, and ultimately, of course, into a um, discourse about politics and about the world. If the postmodern has opened modernist rationality to plurality and, and the deferral, so difference, and it opened the gap between signifier and signify to bring in a plurality of authorships and voices and come to a mobile signifier, then certainly the post-pandemic must rethink the rationality of Wissenschaft and, and, and systemic thinking and science. And this is this funny play about Wissenschaft and science, which doesn't quite work in translation. I, I do purposefully refer to the German Wissenschaft as something that is a thinking that is systematic, chronological, that builds on and references, that evidences what is true and what is right, and that is bound to a system of reference in order to justify and legitimize its utterances, its talking, it, what it says. And what I'm saying it is that evidencing that I'd like to abandon, that evidencing of but I can't, that is then always bound into that ocular centric system that got us to this very precarious place in the first time to open possibilities of thinking the world and thinking sound and thinking ourselves outside this um, mono voiced reference system to bring it to the body, to bring it to confrontation, to, con to conversation, to the contingent body in conversation that we, in a way, don't feel we have to reference everything through that lexicon and through the canons of knowledge, but that it is through our bodies and through our encounters, what we have now been deprived of for quite some time, that we can find another truth and another legitimacy for how we feel and think. Because experience is, in a way, what we are reduced to in the states that we're in, in the pandemic experience, extreme experiences. I find this um, very interestingly portrayed in the word, work of Ana Raimondo, and this particular word, Mi Porti al Mare, is a question she asks passes by to carry her to the sea. So she wears, she's a, she dresses up as a mermaid and sits herself down in urban environment and asks of passes by to carry her to the sea. She forcefully asks for this con confrontation and the conversation and even the physical 
it's a pre, as you see, 2016, a pre-COVID work. And of course, now it has completely new and very pertinent resonances. What does this mean now? If somebody asks us to carry us to the sea, it has new and plural consequences. But what I like about it is that the evidence of this work is not, doesn't have to be carried back through the discourse of, of art, but it can be there and that moment of carrying her in the moment of the demand for the confrontation and the conversation, and in fact, the, the embracing and the holding. Um, so I want to, I'm very interested in abandoning, you know, even if just playfully for now, for now, or maybe I shouldn't say that, maybe we should be really um, consequent and say no, abandoning this notion of evidence and reference as the source of truth or the source of wissenschaftliche rightness because what that always does, if that is the only system, then that system, that system of evidence and reference is always already rigged. It is rigged by the voices who set it up, which are inevitably historically white male Western voices who determine what the references are that count, what the taxonomical important points are, those books, those texts, those references we have to um, pay attention to, pay homage to, those that are real. It is a self-fulfilling prophecy, such objectivity of Wissenschaften, because it can only ever talk about itself and every other voice that does not tread the same paths of references will remain mute, worthless, outside of that discourse. It cannot speak. Um, it is not worth anything within the thinking of, of this. What is not visible and it does not sound. And of course, sound is always a little bit in that position. Sound is always that which is hard to reference, which is hard to evidence. And so very often sound is just talked about the sound of or brought into a musical language or brought into the attribute, the adjective. When we go, and it is not that sound is at fault, but the system is at fault. It doesn't give it space as long as it asks for reference and evidence. And that, of course, is the very same with the plurality of voices. It cannot that we cannot decolonialize, we cannot pluralize how we can think about the world as long as we insist on Wissenschaft, as long as we insist on legitimacy through the evidence, through the system. We have to bring the evidence onto the body, the body that has become so central in the last 12 and something months. So the experience of wars, of hardship, of poverty, of social exclusion, etc., which we had such ample time to ponder sitting at home for 12 months and more in our various states of privilege or deprivation, with a home or without a home, is not represented in the lexicon, in objectivity or even in Wissenschaft. And therefore neither lie there the answers to the problems that led to them and that followed them. We cannot find the answers to a problem that comes from the lexicon, in the lexicon. And so in order to move on without repetition, we must look to the body, the human and the more than human things, to its agency and interactions to find a different thinking and a different possibility. So to be bold, I do want to say, yes, maybe we have to let go of the notion of objectivity and Wissenschaft, at least for discussion, at least to loosen its grip on how we can think. The institution bears witness only to itself and its exclusions without acknowledging thus, they are just outside of what it can talk. It cannot bear witness to the unspeakable, the unnamed, the different, the invisible and the inaudible, that which is not named in its lexicon. And it does, which it simply declares invalid or invisible or it cannot be um, non-existent. It doesn't have worth and value within its discourse. And those that hang on to it must become aware or must reflect on their own irrelevance, since all those other voices, all that other voices that need to be heard are suppressed by it. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that the rigor, the rigor of the objectivity, I'm not trying to get rid of the rigor of objectivity or the rigor of Wissenschaftliche thinking. I am just trying to move it. I'm trying to move it in a different location, outside of the lexicon, which is white, man-made, and when I speak of man and masculine, I do really want to stress that I, I, I speak of it as in Ellen Sixu's term in terms of a masculinity and a femininity that is not um, physiologically based, that is ideologically, culturally um, based in its expression. 
And so that this rigor, the rigor of the lexicon that is white man made, uh, that carries its masculinity and its dominance, its supremacy and its worldview, and um, which is a visual worldview, can be replaced, um, I'm following Judith Rosendahl here, through a robustness that is social or a robustness that I would call that is practice, that is listening, that is sound making from our body, with our body, together in collectivity and alone. So that we can get to the plural possibility of how we can think the world and have a plural knowledge systems through the robustness of the social practice and exchange. So it's not an anything goes and anything is possible a subjectivity and the uh, and an emotive flimsiness. No, it is just that the rigor now lies on the body. This is, of course, not new to those on the margins. All my complaints about the center, that little center I painted here, my complaint about that center is not new to those on the margins. And maybe I am terribly late um, to come to, its, to this realization. As the knowledge on the margins always has to rely on and build its own reference on its own body, on its own locale, on its own practice that is not written in the lexicon, but in those practices and in experience, um, and that is not provided. And again, in the voice, again, this voice has to be heard because only in its articulation can it make itself heard, which is another thing I feel very um, interestingly represented in a work by Lawrence Abu Hamdan. The work is The Language Gulf in the Shouting Valley. Sorry, my bad spelling there. Um, a work from 2013. It is a video work with very few pictures. Most of the time, it just looks like that. But when you hear loud shouting, it's the Golan Heights, um, uh, the Golan Heights between um, 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 near Israel and going into, um, sorry, I just forgot which part it goes into, but that you can't go into because it's sort of no man's land and is, is, is um, fenced and you're not supposed to go in there, but there's this break, this, 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 this moment of breaking through, breaking through these barriers and we can see it every time we hear loud shouting, we can see a video clip and when the shouting stops, oops, what is that? it goes dark again. So this is for me one of those, what I find really exciting about this work amongst the many other things that the work does, that it exactly these voices at the margins become visible only through the shouting when the camera opens momentarily and we can see them. We can see them speak, we can see them being there, claiming land, walking on land, through their bodies, in the practice of their bodies, not as something that is set on a map, that is given to them on a map. In fact, they have to reclaim it. It is a re-territorialization through the body and in practice. Um, Yeah, because otherwise they remain unheard. So it is a light, it is about making a light through those different voices. Which also reminds me again of Ellen Six, who's the laugh of the Medusa, the laugh, the laugh that comes with a different voice, a voice that might not fit into the semantic, that might not fit into um, the system and into Wissenschaft and into objectivity, but that has its own sound and that opens its own space. Maybe that where the space for the post-normal can be found. Because if the center is void, as Karen Barat suggests, and we all sit at the margins, our exchange cannot happen through a relation to the system of objectivity that held on to and legitimizes the center. Our exchange has to happen in different ways. Our realities, our life worlds have to meet in different networks, blockchain-like, from one to the next, rather than going through the center, like. Uh, normal in internet does, for example, where we have to create a contingent views in the way that we meet each other through the confrontation, like Anna Ramondo's demanding to be carried around, demanding to throw our body into the conversation rather than leaving it at a distance, leaving it outside so that objectivity might be preserved as an entirely bodiless physicalness space where nothing is problematized through this body that is less controllable than language that has its own demands, that's plural, that speaks different voices, utterances, breaths that we might not understand, but that still demand for the light, for the camera to go on, for a visibility from the audible. Um, I want to maybe jump a little bit because I'm aware of time here. 
But in, in suggestion is just that this institutional objective position, that that to me is part of a post-normal, the critique of that institutional position for me has to be had now, can be had now, that we go to a forever unnormal without the certainty of the institution, which hangs on the Wissenschaft, on the objectivity and its various exclusions, and that we find a contingent reference system in a plural world, in our bodies, in our emotion, in the things and how we speak. And that as a way to also get to a decolonial and a plural knowledge that is a practical knowledge, that is the knowledge of experience that we have now gathered and that we have been sitting in for such a, um, such a long time, really. Um, and so what is left to talk about uh, in the time that remains is not a theoretical proposition. I do not really have a theoretical proposition. I have the position, the proposition of doing practice, doing practice with the body in order to get to a legitimacy of that voice, of that speech, of that Wissenschaft, and if we can even still call it that a legitimacy of that, that that can sit on the knowledge table so that we can meet in conversation. And it brings me to the body as a site of autobiographical knowledge and autoethnographic knowledge and the leg legitimacy of that, the legitimacy of my experience as an actual experience, as something that is a knowledge. And I do not mean it as a solipsistic, egotistical position of me, 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 but rather as a position that understands that I am only me. I have only this I position, this very fragile, interconnected, codependent I position from which I can hear and make sound through which I live in the world. So the I is all I have rather than it's only me, it's only I. The I is all I have. Um, once I disregard the reference to a central system. It is me in this fragile position that has to seek through this blockchain-like connections, a connection to the world and an understanding of a very contingent way um, and how I have to be responsible for this agency and agitate this position um, and allow through a responsibility, as Haraway calls it, um, others, of course, their positions. And I'm confirmed in this sense of this I as a critical, rigorous, critical position for a post-normal, um, and particularly as a sonic position for the post-normal through other um, writers. So I, I, I make this, I take this position, for example, in conversation with Holger Schulz's writing on sound and anthropology, and he's another speaker in this series, um, which unashamedly foregrounds the self, the I, the narrative of the I as a legitimate place for scholarly discussion. Or I also find legitimacy through Doreen Massie, a social geographer, who talks of geography as not as in maps and territories and the visual um, sense, but as a, as a fluid dimension made from different stories, from all the stories so far. Or I look to Margaret Sheldrick, um, and her notion of the I slot. The deployment of the autobiographical voice is a deliberate strategy for her. What it speaks is not a nostalgia for the subject fully present to herself in a self-indulgent subjectivity, but rather the possibility of mobilizing a series of differentially embodied and multiple I slots. So the realization of our difference, of our multiplicity, internal multiplicity and external multiplicity, and how that is a deliberate strategy, a legitimate place to continue discussion, scholarly discussion, without the reference to the center. So presentness to itself. So the I, the, the, the intention is not to really understand the I, me, you, but to understand that I as a legitimate position to talk about their experiences so that all experiences might be heard that they carry a truce. So this reference, I do not reference my position not in a scholarly lexicon, but in a practice of thinking and doing about how we can think the world outside the objective, the Wissenschaft, the hegemonic knowledge system, which is so important uh, we might deal with and live beyond the extreme, beyond the pandemic. Um, so the desire for the normal pre-pandemic is a rallying cry for the sentimentality and the nostalgic, a longing for a white patriarchal system associated, in my opinion, falsely with the absence of the virus, when in fact it is its breeding ground. 
It is a double bind. We long for it. We long for the virus to go and therefore it's a trickery of the violence of that patriarchal system of an oppression to call us back, to call us back to how it was before, rather than maybe think, no, we can hear the asymmetries. It revealed us the asymmetries. It revealed us the uncertainties. It revealed us the, the collective and the codependence. So we need to go into an other, another place rather than back. Well, it is the perfidy of that violence of the invitations to go back to that which seemed um, safer. In response, in order not to go back to that system, it is the I slot, the autobiographical, our stories so far, the legitimacy of the autobiographical I, that I feel equip us to sound the possibilities and impossibilities of care and collectivity in a post-normal way in a connected and connecting world rather than going back to those other imaginings from the normal before. And that can also obviously help us in this decolonializing of politics of knowledge, um, where we can have plural knowledges and a diverse science that makes for better science. I'm quoting Laura Rival here, a better science that is complementary, adaptive, sustainable, as well as accessible and responsible, so that it can be a science it is a science for, as she for the people it is a science for, as she phrases it, and to the people, for the people it is a sound for, it is a music for, it is a sound art for, that we can talk about these practices that we're all passionate and interested in, art, philosophy, sound, and so on, in the way that it is for us to talking about them, for us as the people, it is a sound art, it is a sound studies for. Um, I can, because I have my slide show up, not see the time. So I have no idea where I'm sitting in time and I have no other means of checking, but I just go on until I get um, stopped. Um, what was very interesting for me, and obviously I'm now coming to this, um, to this eye slot, just before, um, so my only way, in a way, to understand the past 12 plus months and to reflect on them is through my isolate, through my autobiographical, and to find through that experience um, ways of knowing, ways of understanding and ways of coming to that care and the collective. And it was very interesting that just a few weeks before that I at the time lived in London, I now live in Berlin. Um, before um, the lockdown started in London, I did together with my collaborator, Mark Peter Wright, at the De La Pavillon uh, in, in, uh, in Hastings, Hastings, I think, yeah. sorry, uh, um, on, on the seaside outside um, yeah, London, a, a, one of our points of listening workshops, they're collective workshops where we listen together with people, where we um, do different workshops, invite different artists and other people to do workshops with people, to host workshops, to explore a, a, a listened, a heard world exactly for these possibilities to live differently in it, to encounter us differently, to be in conversation differently. And just before the lockdown, very few weeks before the lockdown, of course, the pandemic was already was already with it. We just didn't really know it um, or it hadn't been communicated to us, maybe by people who didn't really want us to, to know it. We did a workshop on careful listening a listening workshop where we um, had invited people into the pavilion. You can see some of the participants here, where we explored how we were in listening, how we were in listening together, then we, were, then we are in looking together, then we are in a, in a, in a visual scenario. And we worked through different modes of, of, of um, exercises to finally together write um, in different stages a manifesto for a careful listening. So a listening with care to each other, to, to reach a collective, uh, to reach another being together, being with um, through sound. Um, and I had written about this being with in the book, uh, but now it strikes me, it is even more important, this notion of being as a being with, as an interbeing, um, these two, three years later now, post-pandemic or post, let's just call it still in the pandemic, but hopefully one day post, um, as a being with that was very important in order to acknowledge um, the, the, the damage exactly of the anthropocentric of which the virus, of course, is one of its symptoms of how we live together, how we live with the world, how we live with animals and with everything in the world. 
So that was kind of in, a, in, a, in an almost serendipitous, um, there as a prophetic way, the, 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 the subject of this workshop. Um, and it was uh, in a going into a hearing with that we are now been sitting in for 12 months, but that we couldn't know at that time. And through listening exercises, through writing in groups, gathering up how we thought, how we hoped we could be together as beings with, we came up with this manifesto for care for listening, a listening for everything. So this is sort of a collective working together. Move and be still, recognize positionality and reciprocity, find feedback as a gesture of touch, listen for everything, everything is valid. Tune in to that which you cannot hear. Ask it questions of what you hear. Let sound become a language without grammar. Let listening become a conduit without words. Stay, care, converse. And it is very interesting for me to read this now, to read this now and think, can this now for us be a sort of, can this help now of how we can come out of if we can come out of lockdown, how we can we meet each other after this to not snap back into a normal, but have a post-normal? Can this in a way be a protocol or a, 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 a strategy, one of many? Or maybe we have to get together and write many of these manifestos and find many ways in which we can practice this being together in a post-normal world. Um, and what it, what it made very clear to me in relation to that is kind of sitting at home, staying at home, being in this extreme position is this cosmopolitanism, which is another point I write about in the political possibility of sound. Again, with hindsight, this cosmopolitanism, I, the idea that um, we are in a connected world and everything has an impact on each other, a sensory, a sonic cosmopolitanism that responds to the asymmetries um, that are hit that hinder a true collective enterprise and disable its imagination and make appreciable the force and the possibility of a shared cosmos. The sunny cosmopolitanism as a political and ethical project that there is power to listening to the condition of politics, a political possibility based on this sonic being together, being with as something that was very important or that now seems strikes me as more important that maybe I would write about it even differently as a radical and in my mind at the moment what I noted down is a radical simultaneity because if sonic possibilities are possibilities that we can hear many voices at the same in the same place now and, and, and an acknowledgement that there is not only one possibility not only one way to be in the world that there is now for me has opened itself up a cosmopolitanism or, or a possibility a pos possible worlds that are not only in space a possibility of all of us in, in our um, radical difference together, codependent into beings, but that it is also a radical simultaneity of time and space, that we, it's not just a then and now and a here and there, but as I said before and at the beginning or try to say maybe in a roundabout and clumsy way, that we can enter through our ears into a dimensionality where we do not have a causality and a chronology that binds us ever back into a normal that came before, but that we can appreciate the simultaneity as something that we agitate, where we have some agitation, what pasts and what histories we want to regenerate, um, we want to go back to, we understand as relevant. Because this one, this notion of a chronology and of a canonical history, I feel, is part of Wissenschaft, is part of objectivity, is part of a distancing science that I am not interested in. And I think that ears do not hear as they hear if you have a sonic sensibility, and I don't just mean an early thing that was a bit confusing, but I mean it as a sonic sensibility and concept that it is a simultaneity of all the stories so far, as Doreen Massey says, and we can choose what to hear and not to hear, or rather to hear everything at once, to hear the polyphony as a cacophony and understand that we cannot draw a line, that lines are um, 
uh, in a way, a, an untruth or, or such a consolidation of something much more complex that we can then not find ourselves in. Because what if we don't belong on that line? What if it is not our line that's in the lexicon that is being evidenced and referenced? So I want the thickness and the mobile place, a place that is full of times and full of places at the same time, where there's a simultaneity of everything in one place and at once, and that we then have to practice, that we have to take the responsibility rather than trust a reference system um, to, to reconcile and make us believe what is most important. But this is where I'm back at practice and the need for practice. This is not just a theoretical endeavor, or maybe it is not at all a theoretical endeavor. Maybe it is a theoretical practice, or maybe it is just simply a practice. And one of the things that was very important to me during the lockdown was, was doing practice and writing scores, writing text scores. And I know I can't see you and I don't know where you are and your various rooms and, and so on and so on. But walls became important, walls became very important about what was um, beyond the walls and how we could not get through the walls to our neighbours because we couldn't share a room or still can't share a room. But we can agitate the walls and we can think through the walls and we can think about partitions, borderlines, maps and all these sort of things. So I wrote a series of walls. Uh, scores about walls. This is one of them. Performing walls. Seven, put on a plastic raincoat. Stand with your front touching the wall. Spread your arms to the left and right of your body. Move them up and down, up and down, making an audible rhythm between the coat and the wall. And obviously, if we were now in a real room, I'd like us all to do this all together. Um, I think it would be great fun to have this confrontation where it is really truly our body and the wall that speaks with each other and makes the sound of the raincoat or whatever coat we have with us and the wall and make this sound together but maybe you can sort of take it with you to do it at home um and another one maybe from a more um difficult time performing walls nine stand half a meter away from a wall facing it let yourself fall into the wall by screaming, don't catch yourself. Sort of in acknowledgement also that I think this was this was on the May 16th. So, you know, a long time ago, only maybe a month in or one and a half months in of lockdown and already the despair was there and can come out through practice and can be repracticed to understand the moment rather than trying to theorize the moment. And for, particularly to understand the moment through performing it, performing it together. Uh, I mean, maybe you want to catch yourself when you do it, but to think through the not catching yourself. Um, because when I think the evidence of anything lies on the body and in practice, the key still is that we practice, this practice needs to be shared. So I'm not talking about a solipsistic mad practice where we can't speak, but it needs to be shared, it needs to be done together, even if it's just giving each other scores to do at home or sing to each other, like um, I saw um, very early on in lockdown in an Italian city where people stood on the balcony and sung together, that it, there needs to be a sharing, but we can have a sharing through practice rather than through the lexicon, so that we don't defer what we can understand, what we can have a consensus and a collaboration about um, to a lexicon to an always already limited um, pool of what is right and what is wrong and what is considered Wissenschaft and what is not, but to share it on the body with the body in a contingent moment. To be done together so that the knowledge is and the, and the, the thinking is done together as conversation and in enactment of the simultaneity that we have and everything we bring into that present moment of acting, of practicing together in terms of time and in terms of space. Voices still need to be invented that make it speak with as a being with rather than solipsistic alone in chaos and cacophony. So we do need voices. My, mine is not a plaidoyer for madness that doesn't speak with each other. It is a plaidoyer for using a sonic sensibility to find different voices. This is not madness, um, it is a vision that we could all have if we trained our ears. It is an access we could have to each other and to a new thinking and a new knowledge if we all trained our ears. The body, the breath, the arms moving against walls, against each other is an attempt to find this conversation that does not pass via the center, 
that has been left anyway during the pandemic with offices empty, but that goes directly to the level where we meet as flesh, borrowing here, of course, from Maurice Merleau-Ponty. Um, and I think listening is this tool to this sharing, to this simultaneity, to this understanding through practice and this, this knowing through practice. Um, and the need for this, I feel, um, Evgeny, are you giving me a sign that my time is almost up? Is that what you uh, You have three, like four minutes. Okay, so I'm going to be really, really yeah, quick. Yeah, wrap you up. <laughs> okay. Um, the reason I'm also going on about that, and the reason I find it so important that we, we consider the normal and not long for going back normal, but practice walls, practice our raincoats, our bodies, find a new confrontation is because my experience of what has happened also during the pandemic to bring it back to a political in the, in the, in the really sense of the political and governance is that at least in the UK, which is still the place I read newspapers from, although I now live um, in Berlin, um, moved in the middle of the pandemic for, I don't know, maybe other reasons to go to another normal that has nothing to do with moving back, but moving forwards. And that's then my um, autobiographical. But that the void, the void that has been created by our absence, by our inability to listen in, by our inability to listen with each other and be with each other has all over the world. But definitely I've witnessed that in England being used for a lot of strange political transformations where literally people have been replaced, say minority representations on board of national institutions have been replaced by people put down from up high from the government. Cut, funding to arts has been cut, funding to arts education has been cut. Um, there has been, um, bills have been introduced that um, stop people from, from, from doing all sorts of things. And I'm not speaking of the laws that keep us safe, the demand for masks or the demand to have distance. I think those are things that I appreciate as part of our responsibility in practicing the world together and seeking asymmetries and seeking the welfare for the weakest in our society. But those laws that have been introduced um, against human rights, for example, in England, and all these cuts and everything that is happening under the cover of, of, um, of COVID, which in a sense is an abusing of that lack of our ears in the mix at the center. And that's why I think it is so important not to simply have a longing to go back to that patriarchal order and to that normal and that privilege it had but to use this extreme that we've been living through and are living through to come to a different landscape. And therefore my findings, if you will, um, from this whole, these whole contemplations and considerations and thinking through the past 13 months um, and what the political possibility of sound now could mean is I have sort of distilled it, if you will, for me to two issues that in order to realize a post-normal where we have a sonic practice in that we meet on the body, with the body of things and of ourselves as mermaids and as other aliens is a sonic pedagogy that is needed. So that listening and the sonic sensibility and the sonic thinking is very crucially um, part of our culture, our enculturation, our, our um, education, because it ultimately emancipates us from this pull to the center and the objective and its sort of singular legitimacy. It would empower us to hear nuances and differences that make different sounds together. And secondly, this notion of the post-normal that we can achieve, I think that we can go to through such a um, um, sonic awareness and the sonic agency and the sonic um, social agency with which we can rethink how we are together in, in through that netting directly between us rather than going through a center and searching for the legitimacy of our exchange from the center but finding it in the contingent confrontation in the contingent meeting practicing together um, etc. in sound, and that sound gives us such a possibility to practice. But I think I can stop here. Um, I think I said enough. <laughs> mm, thank you a lot, uh, Salome. I'm sorry that I should stop you, but we have the time limitations. Totally fine, completely appreciated.
Okay, so, uh, mm, well, we moved to, to the Q&A part and uh, do not hesitate to ask some questions and or comments even. And uh, uh, as a moderator, I will, maybe I will ask a first one because we have already two questions. So uh, thank you again for your uh, such intense and uh, rich report. And uh, I want to agree with you because I also share a similar understanding of the sound as some kind of entity uh, that allows us to overcome uh, Western metaphysics dichotomies and some consequences of it. Uh, also, I agree that sound can be really egalitarian, uh, emancipatory, intersubjective force uh, because its presence for the body uh, really allows uh, one uh, to come to to contemplate a new uh, plural mode of sociality. Uh, but uh, you mentioned this briefly uh, in your report when you described uh, uh, Lawrence Abul Hamdan walk. Uh, but I would uh, like to go in more de detail about it. So uh, as sound can be as egalitarian also can be um, maybe um, like an agent of violence. Mm. Moreover, it can uh, also be um, a dangerous uh, force uh, associated with the power discourse, because uh, um, in some ways it can suppress this plurality. For example, in extreme uh, noise music uh, or in a way of some sonic weapons, for example. So uh, how do we deal with this problem? and uh, uh, how we um, avoid the sound being taken over by power again. Mm -hmm. And uh, next maybe question, uh, how sound art should react on that issue and uh, on that danger. Yeah. I completely agree with you. And in many ways, this was a kind of, you know, a, a very positive um, mm -hmm. polemic on what sound can do in order not to snap back into the normal, but lead us to a post-normal, help us get to a post-normal. And, and I have maybe deliberately, or maybe just out of, out of my own enthusiasm, not mentioned mm -hmm. that, of course, absolutely, you are totally right, sound has historically and is now also used for the very opposite when we think of fascism, when we think of enthralling people into one voice, squashing the plurality of voices, that very power that sound has to free the body, to be part of the mix of voices, not just within the system of semantics or within a, a party line, can also, of course, be reversed. And this is exactly mm -hmm. the danger of the old right. The reversal is their tool um, to, um, to use that possibility. And I suppose that's where I would go back to this notion of sonic pedagogy as, a, mm -hmm. as, a, um, as, as, as very much the tool also for a political education, not just for an education, but for a political education that deals in responsibility and responsibility in Haraway's terms that equips us to hear exactly those manipulations, to recognize not just the semantic, which can be so deceptive, mm -hmm. but that has a, a, an oral literacy that can pick up and understand um, also the, 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 the malign and the exploitative. And, and so we're not pulled in. And I think it is crucially important that sonic pedagogy or the sonic learning, uh, a multi-sensory in general, and an embodied learning becomes part. So we are not um, as manipulable and, and, and can, can desist it. And I suppose that brings me to your second point, which is um, what can sound art do? I suppose sound art as sound art, I, I think what I love about sound art is exactly that it is it is always in the midst of all the things. It lives the simultaneity. Yes, it is art, but it is not just an art in a gallery. It always overflows. It always bleeds into the other rooms and into the outside. So it always bleeds into the political. It bleeds into the everyday. It can't help itself. When visual arts tries to contain itself in the gallery, I don't know whether it always manages either, but at least it makes the semblance of containment sonic art, sound art is not containable. And that's where its strength lies, to interfere, to interrupt, to understand it can be art and it can be pedagogy. It can do participatory practices um, as well as function within the discourse. And I suppose that is 
um, what I find is maybe an additional responsibility um, or a chance for sound artists now to recognize that they are, um, they have the multiplicity, they have a multiplicity of jobs. And mm -hmm. once you deal with sound, you are inevitably in this multiplicitous role where you're not just an artist, you have to engage or you engage also in politics, in discourse, in pedagogy, in in so many things. Um, and I suppose these overlaps and maybe the, the, the breaking up of the discipline of art and the everyday is part of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so maybe we will move to the next question. Um, I will read it. Uh, some of the highly acclaimed if of the so-called experimental music albums of 2020 came from women, women who work with the field recordings of the mundane. For example, Claire Rosie, Pirilla, Ula, etc., who use some really silent sounds when the fields are their homes. Uh, is it somehow related to what you call listening the normality? Uh, first question. And the second one, uh, these recordings also work uh, great as just music. Anyway, should we forget about the aesthetics when we talk about art in 2021 and how ethics, and now ethics is the only thing we left? This is a question. Okay, well, they're both very, very um, fantastic questions and probably very difficult to answer. I do not know the albums and I didn't quite catch the names, mm -hmm. but I think it's very Most interesting. Good, thank you. That that the questioner talks of field recording. I think this this year, this 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 time in lockdown has been a very fertile year for field recording and also for sound walks, because it is one of the things we can really still do. Um, you know, we can go on sound walks. I do a lot of sound walks with with people here, sometimes with masks or just with a good distance, to listen to listen to each other and to listen to the environment, because we are allowed to be outside together when we're not allowed to be indoors together. So I think field recording and and, and sound walks walking and, and has become very important and maybe we have we have cleaned a new ear to listen to the environment um, in that sense now the question was whether these very quiet sounds of these two field recorders right whether that was part of the noon what, what was there exactly the precise question whether that was new, the uh, uh, new normality yeah um I'm, I'm not quite sure what that means, but I would certainly say that, that, that an ear or a sensibility for even the absent sound, um, what is not there, is, mm -hmm. is, is part of what can get us to a post-normal rather than snapping back. So that we become, through field recording, through sound walks, just through a sonic sensibility, aware of also what is not there, what is not heard, or what we don't hear because we don't have the words for it. Um, so I think that is, I can very much understand that as part of a tool and, and, and of a desire for a normality that is different to the one, you know, we might think we want to go back to. Mm -hmm. And the second question, if I understood it right, was about uh, whether we uh, should go back to an aesthetic system. Uh, of it, no, no, it was about relationship between aesthetics and ethics in art and uh, uh, after of the question ask uh, whether uh, in uh, 2021 ethics is the only thing we left maybe we should focus on the on ethics yeah i think ethics and aesthetics are really really fascinating things to ponder together because aesthetics just like a, a scholarly system of reference is of course a matter of taste and taste is established it is the taste that counts let's say in a gallery system or in a musical system is established by a particular class and for a particular reason it is made i don't just like something it is it is actually almost a political statement to say i like this because it's my habit i like it because i've come to like it because of my orientation in the world how i've been brought up um, my my class situation my gender etc so aesthetics is, is always seems so harmless and it is actually totally unharmless because it is the kind of visual or sonic manifestation of, of ideologies and of politics. And so when we try to judge words aesthetically, of course we exclude everything that doesn't really fit in within our sense of what is a good artwork. And when this sense of what is a good artwork is itself this manifestation of already a, a particular political orientation and might exclude many other artistic practices 
um, in a sort of decolonial global sense because they don't fit into that and it's not good art. It's not that it's, you know, it's not that it's not art, it's not good art, or we can't even recognize it as art. We don't understand it as art. It, it doesn't come wrapped in our terms. So maybe it is true that in the end, aesthetics has to be replaced with ethics. If we understand ethics as the question of inclusion and exclusion, if we understand it as a question of engagement, as a participatory ethics, where it's not an ethics of rules, um, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, but where it is an, aesthetic, an ethics of the encounter where you up on the spot have to make up whether something is um, right or wrong. So that, yes, maybe, I mean, this is a very interesting thought to say, you know, we, we have to make do as much as we do with the center of Wissenschaft and objectivity to, to, to say, no, aesthetics is also a rigged system with exclusions. Uh, and we need uh, practical ethics to decide or to engage. We don't even have to decide. Or judge. Um, I think I certainly want to ban these words from aesthetics, but where we can get to our experience of art and talk about it. Yeah, so I, I love this question. I think it's very, yeah, very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, there is one, uh, maybe not a question, but a comment. Uh, I will read it. Thank you so much. The manifesto uh, is similar to the practice of interviews in ethnography and field research. When you try to hear a person in the continuum of his life with all the casual relationships inside his life or the concept of perspectivism uh, by Eduardo Vieres de Castro. This is how we understand and accordingly make the frightening other acceptable. Uh, what do you think about it? Uh, and. Uh, mm, do you well, approach somehow connected with, um, well, it is really connected with some post-colonial ethnography studies, uh, but uh, mm, uh, have you thought about it in more specific way, maybe, maybe in connect with works with of De Castro, etc. I, I, I mean, my, my immediate answer is I'd like to have the name of the of the ethnographer the questioner is mentioning, and it is really interesting because this manifesto was truly written by we were about 16, 17 people workshopping it, mm -hmm. Mark and myself uh, were sort of guiding it, but we were not um, leading people as it were they were really listening we were doing different listening exercises and then it was written collectively so i think it is fascinating that a collectively written manifesto on how we could carefully listen in the world um and um, you know at this cusp of covid meets such a considered an ethical ethnography mm -hmm. and that's why i'd love to have the name of um, yeah, yeah, i will send it Thank you. To, 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 to really follow the question of thoughts or the commentator, commentator thoughts in, in, because I think, I think that's sort of almost like a wonderful coincidence and that reassures me that yes, if you do as a collective work carefully and sensitively that you can come to, you know, you, you come to such a point um, that none of us would probably come to, have come to in its fullness individually. Um, which for me uh, just shows again how the collective, collective listening and sound making uh, is truly important. you typing but uh, you haven't yes. <laughs> I zoom because it uh, freezed and I oh. uh, was forced to uh, leave so I didn't uh, uh, listen to your <laughs> final reply unfortunately oh no I just but I remember that uh, you mentioned about collective job and that somehow it resonates with other thoughts and this is interesting really for you do you believe in a collective uh, production of knowledge meaning etc 
Yes, uh, it just, it's just reassuring to hear this comment, this comment in relation mm -hmm. to what happened without maybe steering towards it. Um, it reassures me and, 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 and confirms in a way this, this, the usefulness of collective sound workshops and participatory mm -hmm. workshops is a very important practice that then obviously leads into a sonic pedagogy that I believe to be uh, or can be instrumental or the, introdu the introduction of sound into teaching and learning beyond um, just, oh, you must listen out or beyond mm -hmm. listening to a particular sound in a musical education but as a sensory and embodied practice is a very useful way to get to these, to get to a post normal, if I may call it that now, as I've started, might as well go on, um, position of understanding the world. Uh, yeah, understood. Thank you, Salome. I think we should uh, finish our today uh, meeting. Thank you again uh, for your uh, lecture. Thank you for everyone who joined us uh today uh, uh look at the schedule we will meet tomorrow at 9 19 o'clock so uh keep in touch and uh stay tuned uh thank you again thank you thank you very much and thank you everybody who listened and asked questions thank you so very much Evgeny. thanks uh you you can look at the chat about the name of this uh, anthropologist and uh, yes, I just wrote it down and then further up yeah. you have the other artists oh Claire Rousset yes yes now yeah, I yeah, understand yeah, yeah. yes absolutely so mm.